Hello, and thank you for joining us for day two of the Integration Symposium here at Fuller Theological Seminary, brought to you by the School of Psychology and Marriage Family Therapy. If you're just joining us for the first day, my name is Brad Strawn, and I am the Evelyn and Frank Freed Chief of Spiritual Formation and Integration, Dean of the Chapel, and I serve as the Chair of Integration of Psychology and Theology here at Fuller Theological Seminary. We hope that those of you who were able to join us yesterday enjoyed the program. Um, a couple of notes before we begin today. First, for those of you joining us looking for translated versions of the program, please watch this short video on how to select that function in Zoom. 오디오로 한국어 통역을 원하시면 여러분의 Zoom 화면에서 통역 버튼을 누르시고 한국어를 선택해 주십시오. Si desea escuchar la traducción del audio al español, haga clic en interpretación en la parte inferior de la ventana de Zoom y seleccione español. If you have purchased CE units, a reminder, a total of six units of CE credit are available. Each two hour session is worth two units. Please note that your attendance on Zoom will be recorded and a completed evaluation form is required for each day you are looking to obtain credit. At the end of the week, a post event survey will be sent to everyone. Um, the evaluation forms uh, will be part of that and will be available to download on the last page of the survey along with instructions on how to submit those. So cert certificates will not be issued until your evaluation forms are submitted via email to psychce at fuller.edu. Again, that is all in the packet you will receive. Today, we will again hear first a presentation from Dr. Robert Emmons with a response from a member of Fuller's faculty followed by a response from a current Fuller student. We will then have a time of question and answer where you're invited to submit your questions on Zoom via the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the page. We encourage you to put your questions there rather than in the chat. I would now like to invite Fuller Seminary's Chief Operating Officer and Dean of the School of Psychology and Marriage and Family Therapy, Ted Kosey, to bring welcome and a prayer. Thank you, Brad, Dr. Strawn. Uh, and welcome everyone to day two of the 2022 Integration Symposium hosted by Fuller's School of Psychology and Marriage and Family Therapy. Uh, these symposia have a long tradition. Uh, in fact, I would argue that the very first Integration Symposium was held in 1961, uh, 60 years ago. And that speaker at that time was a Dr. John Finch, who many of you recognize that name. Uh, at that time, Dr. Finch was a Tacoma, Washington, psychologist, and he had been invited to Fuller to speak by C. David Werhauser, another name that many of you might recognize because our school building is named after him. And he was also a chair of our board. Uh, I'd like to just read uh, an excerpt uh, from a book um, that was written about the history of Fuller School Psychology. That book is called Psychology and the Cross, the Early History of Fuller Seminary's School Psychology. And I would like to read an excerpt from that book that described what happened 60 years ago after that initial integration lecture. So on page two of the book, the Finch lectures had been well received. The auditorium in Peyton Hall, which many of you recognize, had been packed each day with students and faculty to hear Dr. Finch talk on three topics. The first topic was the importance of a view of man. The second topic was Freud and the dissenters. And the third topic was spirit in the psyche. Charles Fuller, the seminary president, had attended every lecture. He sat on the front row and responded warmly to Dr. Finch's call for a type of counseling that called for meeting emotional conflict with the teachings of the Christian faith and existential insight. So following the lectures, Charles Fuller, the president of Fuller at that time, walked up enthusiastically to Dr. Finch and said, this is what we need. So I would um, argue that it's still what we need. And I'm so happy that we have uh, uh, Dr. Um, Emmons with us to continue in this very long tradition over 60 years in the history of our seminary. Like many of you, I'm a practitioner. I um, have a practice, I see clients. And one of the reasons I want to come to the seminar is to uh, learn more about gratitude and how I could help my clients. Uh, in the expression of gratitude. I find many of them have struggles in that area. 
but I'm also here for myself. I want to learn more about gratitude and how I can enhance my own Christian walk and become uh, a better Christian uh, and grow in that way as well. So for whatever reason you're here, whether it's for your clients, for your friends, for your family, or for yourself, I welcome you on day two of the symposium. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be together. Thank you for Dr. Emmons. Thank you for just the ability to meet and use this technology to reach so many people. I pray that your spirit fill Dr. Emmons with your wisdom, uh, that you guide him as he talks, and that your spirit be in all of us as we listen and, and absorb and think about uh, and reflect on how we can utilize a gratitude and the use of gratitude, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of others. We just thank you for this opportunity to gather today in this way. And we pray all of this and all of your blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, and now to introduce our featured speaker, um, our respondent and our student respondent. Dr. Emmons is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of California, Davis, and a distinguished visiting scholar at Biola University. He received his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's the author of more than 250 original publications in peer-reviewed journals or chapters, and has written or edited eight books, including Thanks, How Practicing Gratitude Can Make You Happier, Gratitude Works, a 21-day program for creating emotional prosperity, and the Little Book of Gratitude. A leader in the positive psychology movement, Dr. Emmons is founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Journal of, Psych of Positive Psychology. His research focuses on the psychology of gratitude as it relates to human flourishing and well-being. His groundbreaking work on gratitude has been featured in dozens of popular media outlets, including the New York Times, USA Today, US News and World Report, Newsweek, Time, NPR, Consumer Reports, and the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and the Today Show. We're so happy to have you with us, Dr. Emmons. Following Dr. Emmons, we will hear from Dr. Pamela Epstein-King. Dr. King is the Peter L. Benson Professor of Applied Developmental Science and Clinical Psychology and Executive Director of the Thrive Center for Human Development here at Fuller. She first joined Fuller as Assistant Professor of Marital and Family Studies in 2008 after serving the School of Psychology and Marriage and Family Therapy for eight years as an adjunct and research professor. King's academic and applied efforts aim to promote a movement of human thriving that contributes to flourishing societies. She is passionate about understanding what individual strengths and environments enable diverse humans to grow individually, relationally, and aspirationally. To this end, she has led in building an empirical field of study of religious and spiritual development within developmental psychology that provides a psychological science perspective of spiritual formation. She is co-author of The Reciprocating Self, Human Development and Theological Perspective, a co-editor of the Handbook of Spiritual Development in Childhood and Adolescent, and co-author of the inaugural chapter on research on religious and spiritual development in the seventh edition of the Handbook of Child Psychology and Developmental Science. Finally, we'll hear from Fuller student Hannah Che. Hannah is a third year PsyD student who is studying and specializing in culturally informed psychotherapy. We are glad to have them all here with us today, and we look forward again to a time of Q&A during their presentations. You will be prompted uh, to put your questions in the Q&A section. You may also put comments and connect via chat. We invite you to do that to make sure you select everyone uh, in the drop-down menu so that all attendees can see your comments rather than just the host and panelists. And before we begin, again, Dr. Emmons, I just wanna say thanks. Thanks. Good one, Brad. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. I don't have to do the shameless self-promotion now, uh, but I might anyway tomorrow. We'll see. Uh, well, thank you. And once again, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be with you. You know, it would be so nice if we were together in person uh, or not. We are together, but not in person. Uh, I would like to ask you, though, like, where are you all listening from or watching from? Where are you joining us from today? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, you know, just quickly, your location. I'm here in Davis, California, Maine. All right. Maine is uh, my second home state where I lived for five years. All over the place. Burbank. Minnesota. 
I think a lot of these places, it's a lot colder right now than it is in California. Just, just a wild guess. Germany, they're going past, they're scrolling so fast. I don't know who's the furthest away. Krakow, Poland, that's pretty far. India, that might be the record for distance. I don't know, Costa Rica, awesome. Northern California, Central Valley, Philadelphia, New England, 60 degrees, all right. Let's hear it for New England, my, my native land. So uh, how many of you know where Davis is? So when I took the job here, actually when I, when I applied for the job here, I did not know where Davis, California was, believe it or not. Uh, this was 1988. So I thought it was in Southern California. Like a lot of people, I figured all of California is like the beach, you know, in Southern California. So I uh, pulled out a map and I looked at, and I saw uh, San Francisco, I saw Davis, I saw San Francisco, uh, Lake Tahoe, Yosemite, Napa Valley. And I thought, you know, this might be okay. This might not be a bad place uh, to spend some time. So here it is uh, 34 years later and I'm still here. And so thank you very much. I'm glad to see such a global representation of folks from all over the world, which makes sense because after all, gratitude is a global concept as we learned yesterday. I, I, I hope I was able to convey to you some of the excitement, some of the enthusiasm, some of the passion I have for spreading the message of gratitude. There's so much we've learned about it, uh, but so much more we still need to know. We really are at the tip of the proverbial iceberg and uh, hope to learn a little bit more today and to share with you, you know, what I've learned and can't wait to hear what questions and thoughts you have on your minds. Uh, as we move into the question and answer period. So uh, occasionally I get asked uh, to preach in churches, uh, which by the way, is an activity that I am uniquely unqualified for, okay? Uh, but uh, have, having never uh, you know, attended seminary or uh, taken a course in homiletics, uh, but as long as they let me preach you know, the, the good news of gratitude, uh, it's all good, uh, I'm okay. So that's what I always, you know, attempt to do. And I suspect that's why I get asked anyway, uh, to come to uh, churches and, and to do that. Well, I, I've listened to enough sermons, though, over the years to know that one should always begin with scripture, right? You got to start with scripture and go from there. So that's what I'm going to do today. Go ahead, uh, my guy, Reed, start the slideshow. Perfect. Today we're going to talk about <clears throat> gratitude to God and uh, talk a little bit about identity, uh, the spirit of gratitude. Uh, yesterday I introduced you to the science of gratitude, what gratitude is and <clears throat> how it works and why it matters, the difference that it makes. We're going to continue along those lines, but move more into talking about the, the spirituality of gratitude. What do religious traditions and faith traditions have to say about it? How is it approached uh, differently? from a spiritual point of view, as opposed to a more, you know, scientific or psychological or empirical point of view. Uh, but anyway, I do want to begin with a, a scripture <laughs> and I find it sometimes useful to, uh, to preach from, I don't want, I shouldn't even say I preach from it because I'm not a preacher, speak from uh, the very famous account, uh, Luke chapter 17 verses 11 to 19, uh, the familiar parable where Jesus heals the 10 lepers, okay, which I always found fascinating, uh, this parable as a, as a child, you know, growing up uh, in a Christian family, attending Christian schools, uh, going to Christian churches, uh, eating Christian foods, wearing Christian clothes, and all of those things. Uh, this, this parable always fascinated me, I guess maybe because um, it's just so shocking that, you know, 90% of those who received a tremendous gift from Jesus were ungrateful and only one was. Uh, I think it was more than that though. I think it was just because it was about leprosy, which I found so fat as a child, you know, uh, attending a Catholic school, the way that the nuns uh, describe leprosy, it was always so in such graphic uh, terms. Uh, I found that interesting as well. Anyway, uh, you're all familiar with this, I suspect, right? So uh, we know that, uh, Jesus heals, right? They, they're asked to uh, 
have mercy on us, you know, Lord. And he says, go show yourselves to the priests who were, you know, the public health officials. They had to declare the lepers clean so they could return back into uh, society. And so he does, in fact, heal them of their physical disease and of their social stigma, pronounced clean of their contagious condition, no longer social outcast. They get their old lives back, right? They get to go back to their communities. They go back to their families for the first time in years. You know, they can uh, hug their children and kiss their wives and uh, they're no longer social outcasts, get their lives back. And basically they, they're brought back to life. I mean, Jesus does a ton for them, right? And so you would think they would be tremendously grateful, right? Um, what was their response, right? Only one returns to give thanks. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice, threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, so where's everyone else? Basically, you know, where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Well, uh, growing up again, <clears throat> the way I was always taught this parable and the meaning of it, the interpretation was it was, uh, isn't it uh, great that uh, one person came back? You should be like that one person, right? Don't be like the other nine. Don't be an ingrate, but be grateful, right? Model yourself after the one individual, okay? Uh, and that was kind of surprising, but uh, I heard a sermon a few years ago, which really just changed the way I thought about this parable and kind of changed the way I thought about gratitude and giving and gifts and grace uh, and all of those things. And uh, the interpretation I heard, which is what I try to share with people when I, uh, I preach on this, again, teach from it or talk about uh, this parable, is that what was most surprising was not that one was grateful or that nine was not. What was surprising was that Jesus heals all 10 knowing full well that only one was going to come back and be grateful. So Jesus's gift of healing was not based on expected gratitude, right? Uh, while it's the case that, you know, grace will, will mobilize gratitude, okay? That is a person who receives a free gift will in fact be grateful if they recognize it as such. Uh, gratitude does not mobilize grace or expected gratitude does not mobilize grace, right? So to Jesus gives, even though knowing that no one's going to come back or very few, 10% are going to be grateful. So I think this is super important. And it, it, it um, led me to think about ways in which gratitude in a divine context is different than gratitude in a person to person or human to human context. The difference between divine giving and human giving. Uh, after all, we give, uh, I think, largely because we expect to be thanked, right? And what happens when we give and give and give and we don't get thanked, the person just ignores us or, you know, never writes that thank you card or shows no signs of gratitude. Eventually, you know, the gifts dry up, you know, we move on and say, hey, that's an ingrate. Uh, you know, why, why should I bother to continue to show gifts, give gifts and show grace and compassion and so forth? But divine giving, very different from our own giving. So one way in which I think gratitude to God or in a divine context is different from human gratitude. Well, I start with that just to uh, say today I want to talk more about gratitude in a spiritual context or in a context of uh, theological uh, knowing or awareness. Okay. I like to think about gratitude as a spiritual concept right? Um, yesterday, we talked about it as a psychological concept or construct, you know, as, as a way of seeing, a way of looking at life, uh, as an emotion, as an attitude, uh, as a form of coping. Uh, today, we're going to talk about it as a virtue. Uh, I know Pam is going to uh, share with us her thoughts about gratitude as a virtue. I think of it as all of those things and more. It really does direct our minds to the vast oceans of reality that are invisible. When you think about gratitude, I think gratitude is a spiritual quest. You know, it's a search for origins. I mean, what is a search for origins if it's not religious, right? We're searching for the origins of, of ourselves, of our identity, of goodness in the world, the good that we receive from others, of benevolence, of kindness, of compassion. It's a profoundly spiritual quest, okay? And so the need to understand origins is a spiritual quest. 
gratitude, I believe, directs our minds to the vast oceans of reality that are not visible. When we're grateful for something, we, consi we consider, where does it come from, right? Who gave it to us? Why did this come about? Uh, what would my life be like if I did not have this in my life or this person or this gift or this goodness, right? So we, we profoundly reflect on these things. We affirm the good, as I mentioned yesterday, and then we recognize the sources of this good. I think that these are, you know, profoundly spiritual questions. In addition to others, we could ask like, you know, now having received this good, how should I respond, right? What do I do with this good? How do I treat this good in accordance with the intentions of the giver? and all of those things. Uh, so we know that the, the, the texts, the teachings, the traditions, the sayings, the scriptures, the sacraments of all the relig religious traditions um, privilege gratitude. Gratitude to God, gratitude to each other. These are all very important worldviews that tell us that there's something very fundamental about human beings when it comes to thankfulness, gratefulness. As I mentioned yesterday, the deepest touch point of uh, human life. Well, some of you, and I mentioned this briefly in passing yesterday, some of you may be aware of or familiar with uh, a major research initiative that was sponsored by the John Templin Foundation on the very topic of gratitude to God. Uh, again, it, it occurred to me some years ago, and I had been involved in other initiatives and uh, wrote uh, successful grants to help get people to sponsor their research on gratitude in a relational sense, interpersonal sense, developmental psychology social psychology, gratitude in medicine, gratitude in healthcare, gratitude in educational settings, and so on. Uh, but it occurred to me that virtually none of the research that had been published on the science of gratitude looked explicitly and specifically of, about gratitude in a spiritual context, especially gratitude to God. So with some encouragement and some um, uh, support from, well, a lot of support and a lot of encouragement from the Templin Foundation, we were able to uh, obtain a grant as a project that is uh, jointly with uh, Biola University and the University of California, Davis, uh, that's designed to examine just ways in which gratitude to God differ from person to person gratitude. A drawing upon theology and philosophy and religious studies and people and, and uh, researchers and scholars from various uh, traditions so one of the reasons why I love to study gratitude is that it is so complex. There are so many layers and levels to it. It does require examination from a number of different viewpoints, uh, both involving the sciences as well as the humanities. And so that's what this initiative is all about. And I'm not gonna go into that, into the individual projects, but if you're interested, just go to the Gratitude to God website. It's gratitudetogod.com. And you can read descriptions of the, the projects. It's something like 26 projects, uh, both uh, early career, uh, younger people with uh, brand new PhDs or some about to get their PhDs, postdocs, as well as older, uh, more senior experienced individuals uh, examining various ways in which gratitude to God is played out uh, in people's lives and what it all means and, and uh, all those sorts of things. Well, Let me give you just a couple of quotes uh, that may be familiar to you. I'm going to throw a lot of names of people today. And this is kind of how I do integration. Uh, you know, I know integration means a lot of different things to different people. And I mentioned yesterday when I first began my forays into gratitude, I would just try to, you know, devour everything I could that had been written about gratitude. Well, that soon became very overwhelming because there's a lot, uh, you know, psychologists, relative latecomers to the study of gratitude, but it's been around as a concept in philosophical religious thought and spiritual and philosophical writings for many, many centuries, in fact. Um, but it's really at the heart of faith, especially the Christian faith. Although again, uh, one can find cases and examples of it and, and encouragements and scriptures and uh, practices and rituals and litanies and all the major faith traditions. It was John Wesley who said that true religion is right tempers towards God and man. It is in two words, benevolence and gratitude. Gratitude to our creator and supreme benefactor and benevolence to our fellow creatures. I thought, oh, that's beautiful, right? I mean, that's the, that cuts right to the heart of it right there, right? Two things, right? Benevolence, gratitude. And then it's, you know, it's benevolence, which issues out of gratitude. When one is grateful, one wants to give back the good they've received. 
Uh, in fact, you can think of gratitude that way as giving away the goodness or giving back uh, the goodness. So, so I like that. Uh, what else do I have for you today? Let's see, let me give you a definition of gratitude, a little bit different than what I gave you yesterday when I said, hey, remember, uh, there's two things. There's affirmation and there's recognition, true enough. But this is a definition that comes from uh, someone who's thought I admire very, very much. This is Charles Matthews. Chuck Matthews is a professor of religious studies at the University of Virginia, and he's involved in the Gratitude to God initiative. And he defines gratitude this way. Now, again, he's taking a, a perspective from uh, the uh, study of religions or humanities as opposed to empirical sciences. And he says that gratitude is a loosely coherent spectrum of responsive attitudes manifest by humans in their dealings with one another and the cosmos. A response more than a preemptive attitude. Gratitude is one of the more durable features of human existence. So uh, what he says uh, is that, look, you know, we can study gratitude a lot of different ways. Gratitude has been, has been the serious uh, object of serious study of traditions for centuries, right? Uh, in distinctly philosophical, and theological ways. Now, psychologists come along and say, okay, here's how we're going to study this and measure it and define it and see what its effects are in people's lives and all those things that I shared with you uh, yesterday. But I'm fully aware I'm in full agreement with uh, Matthews that, you know, psychologists don't have monopoly uh, on the truth when it comes to understanding gratitude, that in fact, it does require insights and perspectives and examination from a number of different vantage points, especially those in theological perspectives and philosophical thought as well. Listen to this. This is what, what Chuck writes. He says, many scholars who study gratitude recognize that Thin conceptions of gratitude. By thin, he mean you know solely empirical uh, examinations, like I talked about yesterday, like having people write a gratitude journal, developing a questionnaire to measure gratitude. That's good. That's fine. But sometimes maybe we need to add a little bit more, a few more layers, uh, to be able to give some texture and color to our notions of gratitude and gratefulness and thankfulness. These thin conceptions only imperfectly capture the more ancient traditions of religious and philosophical inquiry and off, often miss their most important insights. These traditions typically attend to gratitude not only in terms of our sociality, but also as reflecting our participation in a world or uh, yeah, in a world normatively experienced, speaking to realities and relationships that more narrowly empirical approaches can have a hard time incorporating. These realities include the fundamental structures, forces, and agencies that undergird the normal intelligibility of the cosmos and the possibility, perhaps, the necessity that humans must somehow relate to them. Serious attention to these traditions then could not enormously enrich these recent inquiries, right? So he's saying, look, the psychology, we need that. Wait, we need the sciences, okay? We've made a lot of progress in understanding what gratitude is and how to get more of it, why it matters and how it works. But we also need the insights from these more ancient traditions, which can add a lot of layers and textures and um, deepening and broadening our understanding of gratitude. Because as I mentioned yesterday, uh, it occurs, it appears in all these traditions uh, and has from the beginning of time in the scriptures, in the teachings, the text traditions, and so on. Well, theologians have a lot to say, and there's a lot to contribute, and they have become very vocal in uh, adding to the adding to the rich texture of our understanding and the scholarship of gratitude, as have philosophers, especially from the field of moral uh, philosophy. I mentioned yesterday that, uh, you know, my, my goal has been to explore the ways in which gratitude is a really deep touch point of human existence. And I said that lots of great things have been said about gratitude down through the ages, especially by philosophers who said it's the greatest of the virtues or the queen of the virtues, it's a parent of the virtues. They say it's the secret to life, the key that opens all doors, a virtue as vast as life itself. Now that's only half the picture, okay? Because if you actually look at what people have said about ingratitude, even more powerful statements have been made about ingratitude as a vice. If, if um, gratitude is the queen of the virtues, it would seem that ingratitude can qualify 
as king of the vices. Ingratitude is, in fact, is an accusation. It's nice if people say you're grateful or you think of yourself as a grateful person. You know, that's all well and good. But one thing you don't want to have people say about you is that you're an ingrate, that you're an ungrateful individual. So ingratitude is actually an, an accusation, right? The essence of vileness. I think that was Immanuel Kant who said that. Uh, David Hume said it was a most horrible and unnatural crime, a malignancy of the soul, monstrous and hideous, one person said about ingratitude. Uh, how about Jonathan Edwards throughout one other uh, famous uh, name from centuries ago, had quite a bit to say about gratitude, especially supernatural gratitude. And he made that famous distinction between natural gratitude and supernatural gratitude, gratitude to God for the benefits that God provides, but there's also gratitude just for the nature of who God is. Uh, this is what he said about ingratitude. Call me ungrateful and call me all that is bad. It is impossible there should be a more odious character given a man than that he is ungrateful. So uh, pretty powerful stuff, right? Um, so gratitude, virtue, ingratitude, vice, uh, whether we take a you know, theological, philosophical, or for that matter, psychological perspective, uh, each of these disciplines shows a remarkable agreement on the nature of uh, the, the concept here. Now, one of the things I mentioned yesterday is that gratitude involves a recognition, recognition that the sources of the good thing that we have or goodness itself comes from outside of the self. Okay, this in itself can be controversial. Uh, one could say, well, it is possible I could be grateful to myself or grateful for good things that I have. And yes, uh, at least certainly the latter part of that makes a lot of sense. And we know that people are grateful for qualities, talents, strengths, abilities that they have. This enables them to give back the good they receive basically what they're doing, they're giving back the goodness, they're giving away part of themselves uh, because gifts become you know, an expression and extension of ourselves. That's uncontroversial. Uh, quite a bit different to say that one thanks oneself for one's gifts. Uh, you have to deal, do a little mental um, uh, trigonometry to make that work. But I do wanna talk about the recognitions of gratitude, okay? What gratitude requires. I mentioned yesterday that typically there's a, there's a three-part uh, sequence here, a three-term construal, to use the words of uh, philosopher Bob Roberts, who says it always involves uh, three things, a benefactor, a benefit, and a beneficiary, right? A gift, a giver, and a receiver. So what do we recognize? Well, when we are grateful, we recognize that there's a good, there's a benefit that we have received. We have something of value. Okay, uh, we recognize there was a giver behind that, some form of external agency. So we are sensitive to the gift, we're sensitive to the giver. The essential direction of gratitude is outward. Uh, that's what I want to say. That's how I want to express that. The, the essential direction of gratitude is outward. It's self-transcendent. Okay? It, it's, it connects us to something outside of ourselves, which again, is one of the reasons why I see it as a profoundly spiritual concept. And so the search for what we're grateful for is in fact a spiritual quest. We recognize that it is undeserved or unearned or unmerited. You know, think about the concept of grace. What is grace? You know, it's unmerited favor uh, shown to you. We're, we're undeserving, but we get a good thing despite the fact that we may not have earned it or deserve it or expected it or merited it. Uh, we cannot claim it by right, but there it is uh, nevertheless. Uh, fourth, in, and this one is, don't always have to have this element, I think, to experience gratitude. We must recognize uh, that there's intentionality on the part of the giver. Now, if we have that, we're more likely to experience gratitude. If we believe that person or our agent has intentionally provided the benefit for us, we're more likely to be grateful, right? So I'm, I'm going to say usually, but not always, because we can imagine occasions where, you know, uh, we're, we're benefited, but not in a direct personal way. We just happen to be the recipient of a good thing, which is coming our way as well as the way of other people. Nobody intended us for us specifically, but yet we feel grateful anyway. Or maybe they actually did not intend it for our benefit, but it was a side effect. You know, maybe their intention could be selfish by giving us a gift. You know, gift giving is, uh, there's all sorts of issues involved with gift giving, right? It, you know, gifts can bring, you know, pride, gifts can bring envy, Gifts can, gifts can be humiliating sometimes if we feel we can't you know, return it, uh, return the favor, right? If it's out of proportion, 
uh, in the context of the particular relationship. Right? So, so gift giving, gift exchange uh, can be very problematic. And so uh, we can't always say that someone intends the gift for our benefit because there could be other motivations uh, behind that. All right. And then lastly, and this I think is perhaps the most critical point here. Well, they're all critical, but, but the need to give back the good that we've received. What distinguishes being grateful from merely being happy or being uh, joyful, as Rebecca Barrett mentioned yesterday in her comments, or being pleased by something? It's a positive feeling, but there's also the desire to give back in some measure to which we have received. Okay, we want to make a return. A grateful person wants to favor others because he or she has been favored him or herself, right? That's the distinctive mark of gratefulness, the need to give back, to make a return, distinguishes gratitude from other positive feelings. And maybe one reason why it's not purely a, you know, a uh, positively valenced feeling as a, as a feeling, because it can be uh, also saturated with feelings of, you know, responsibility, obligation, indebtedness, and so on. So, um, there's a, a quote that I have on my, I keep on my wall because I find it very uh, motivating and very uh, insightful by Tony Cronman. Tony Cronman is the former Dean of the Yale University Law School. And this is what he says about giving back a gift or reciprocating a gift. He says, second only to the inability to feel gratitude, the worst disaster that can befall a human being is to be blocked in the desire to thank the world by making a reciprocating gift that is adequate to the one he or she has received. He's saying that's part and parcel, that's foundational and fundamental to gratitude, is giving back the good that we have received. Well, Kramen has said some um, interesting things, also some controversial things about gratitude, especially in a Christian context, which I will get to and share with you, uh, a quote with you in just a moment. The point of all of this is just to remind us that gratitude is complicated. It's not, it's not a simple good feeling in, in response to a benefit or a goodness, but it can become complicated uh, quite easily because it can raise up issues of dependency, right? So here we are, we're dependent upon a giver. Uh, what about that? What happens if that giver has, you know, benefited us, but also harmed us in any kind of long-term relationship? There's a mixture of, you know, probably being, being harmed or being slighted uh, by the same person who has benefited us in various ways. That makes gratitude complicated, uh, especially, you know, in a, in a relational context. What about obligation? I'm obligated to give back the good. It doesn't feel quite right just to be, always be receiving and never to give back, right? A sense of indebtedness. There's different meanings of indebtedness. And some of the people in the Gratitude to God project are trying to tease apart what is good indebtedness or glad indebtedness? Well, we want to be indebted. It feels good. It, it connects us uh, in a deep and substantial and sustainable way with our giver versus a debt we want to wipe out as soon as possible, you know, like, like a car loan or home loan. You feel good uh, when you cross that debt off. Uh, but a debt of gratitude is something we may want to hold on to a little bit because it, it, it binds us to our giver. But again, remember that the gift is freely given, okay? Uh, it's unearned. If I give a gift, I'll say to someone, okay, I'm going to give you a gift, and this is what I want to return. Okay? It ceases to be a gift, right, because now there's strings attached to it. So that's why the gift has to be freely given and voluntarily given. What if I can't pay back the gift? What if it is too great a gift that there's nothing I could ever do that would be as good or as great as the gift I've received? It seems to me that would be a little bit uncomfortable psychologically, emotionally for people. Could the gift actually become a burden as opposed to a blessing? And this is what Cronman says in his book, which if you haven't read any of it, uh, I don't necessarily recommend you reading it cover to cover because it's like 1,100 pages. So, so here it is, you know, pretty substantial. You see, I got through about the first, you know, couple of chapters. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what he says is that Christian, he says that, he argues that Christianity is the religion of unrequited gratitude because Christians, he says, can never make an appropriate return for the good they have received from God. So we're overwhelmed by this need to give back. The gratitude owed to God is overwhelmed. There's no way we could ever reciprocate all of the goodness, all of the, the good things uh, that we've received 
in life were never able to thank God adequately for his gifts. This indebtedness, he says, is unbearable. The, uh, the unbearable indebtedness of being, I guess you would call that. Okay, he says, even, you know, he said, well, what about, you know, loving others or loving God? Isn't that a good way to give back? He said, no, even that's not a sufficient return since God first loved us. Therefore, the love we feel is never ours to give in the first place. Also, we can never return a love that is as good or great as God's love. So all of this becomes a cause of envy and rebellion toward God and overall spiritual malaise more generally. He believes that characterizes uh, modern time. Well, you may or disagree or agree with that. I don't know. It's, I think it's controversial. I, you know, is he right? Is he wrong? Um, I just think it's, again, it's, it's an example. And I, and I include this just to say that people are thinking about these issues in, in, in very sophisticated ways, ways in which, you know, gratitude to God is different from person to person gratitude. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to start to probably go a little bit more quickly because I want to be sure I say certain I've noticed there's a phenomenon, maybe you're familiar with it, if you've been, been uh, any, had any kind of experience public speaking. As a speaker, the time goes really, really fast. As a listener, the time can go really, really slow. For me, it's going really, really fast. And so I'm going to probably skip a few things. I did mention yesterday that we talk about gratitude as a trait. We've developed the GQ questionnaire. If you're interested, you know, I can send that to you. You can look it up online. It's, it's uh, widely available. You can take it, find out if you're a grateful person or not. You can use it in clinical work. You can use it in research. Um, it's a quick six question uh, questionnaire, works really, really well. And it gets at, I think, in some sense, uh, an aspect of the grateful virtue, the, the virtue of gratitude, which uh, I believe Pam is going to talk more about. So, uh, so that makes my job a little bit easier. I can skip over some of this. Um, I, I just wanna, uh, again, um, give a shout out to another person in the Gratitude to God project. This is Tony Manella, who I think thinks more deeply about gratitude than anybody I've ever come across that I've read or that I know. He's a philosopher at Siena College, and he's written many, many articles and chapters on gratitude as a virtue. And more recently, he's taken up uh, the question of how does gratitude to God differ from gratitude to people? It's basically what gratitude is. It's a collection of, of there's cognitive elements, there's emotional elements and there's behavioral elements to gratitude. Uh, there's a, uh, and they're all interrelated. There's a package which, you know, combined constitutes a disposition, which is known as the grateful virtue, the disposition to form and sustain a properly grateful response to the right people at the right time and to the right degree. Okay, so it's not, it's not merely a thought. It's more than a feeling. Uh, it's not just a behavior of saying thank you, but it's an interrelated package or cluster of different elements. Okay? Now, why this is useful is because it can also help unpack the nature of ingratitude. You know, sometimes we learn about what something is by understanding what it is not or the opposite of it. And so uh, Tony, in one of his articles, you could just Google Google this if you're interested. Just, just put in his name, Tony Manella, and you can get uh, the text uh, versions of different uh, papers or chapters he's written. He has one on the varieties of uh, gratitude. It's called The Virtue of Gratitude and Its Associated Vices, where he really unpacks and, 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 and um, articulates the ways in which we can fail to be grateful. Okay, And what he says, there's, there's three basic ways we can fail to be grateful, given that gratitude involves the right kind of thoughts, the right kind of feelings. So thoughts about the, the giver and the gift, feelings toward the giver, and then behaviors toward the giver. So he's saying ways we could be ungrateful, okay, are failures of attunement where we're just insensitive to the nature of the gift or the giver, what he calls failures of establishment, when it, when it comes to uh, becoming uh, thinking about how we can repay the benefactor or give back the goodness that we received, as well as failures of duration that have to do with time, how long we are grateful for it. Let me show you in a chart, which I think I, I try to depict things graphically, represent them this way. It's a little bit uh, easier to uh, understand, I think. So he says, we start here at the top of the pyramid, gratitude as a virtue, right? It's this uh, predisposition this interrelated uh, sequence of elements, 
the right kind and degree of gratitude in all situations which it is called for, cognitive, affective, and behavioral. And then we can be insensitive to the goodness. We, we could just not recognize it or not be attuned to it. We may not be grateful for a long enough period of time. You know, so if someone does a favor today and we forget all about it, you know, tomorrow, that's not good. Or if we act on it too quickly, uh, let's say, you know, somebody has us over for dinner or takes us out to dinner. And at the end of the night, we pull out our checkbook and we say, how much do we, do we owe you, right? That's not being a very gracious receiver. Or we invite that person to our home the next night. No, you want a little delay there, right? You need to be grateful for a long enough period of time uh, before it's appropriate to, uh, to reciprocate. And so, and then failure of establishment, each of these has both over and under. So you can have too much gratitude or too little gratitude. You can have a deficiency or an excess. We could be overly grateful. Uh, somebody brought up the question yesterday, can you have too much gratitude? And I think so. You could be overly grateful where you magnify the gift. You know, if somebody holds the door open for me today and I spend the rest of the day profusely thanking them, you know, and running around opening the door for other people, and that seemed a little out of proportion. Uh, you know, or if somebody, you know, uh, saves my life, you know, uh, I, you know, they push me out of the way of an oncoming vehicle, you know, and at some point, you know, I send them a little thank you card or whatever. It doesn't seem quite enough. So I can have an, an, an under, uh, you know, I can have a deficiency or excess of gratitude. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that if you're interested in probing deeper into the nature of the variety of ways to be ungrateful, uh, he is a very good source to go to. Okay, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to talk a little bit about spiritual practices. Okay, for us to grow our gratitude, to develop our gratitude more deeply and more sustainably, I think we have to practice this uh, intentionally and consistently over time. We know that religions do practices very well. They do litanies very well, litanies of remembrance, litanies of practice. There's individual, there's corporate practices. As Dr. Young mentioned yesterday in his re reply, there's you know things we do in groups. There's things we do together uh, uh, when we worship, but there's also private reflective exercise that we can engage in as well. When I teach psychology religion, or when I used to, uh, since now I don't teach undergraduates anymore, I've used this book by Christian Smith. And one of the great things, it's a very comprehensive book. It's very high level of challenges uh, our students. Uh, there's a table where he lists the variety of religious practices. And you can see teeny tiny print, you can't read them probably. There's like a hundred religious practices that he identifies as being, you know, part of at least one major religious tradition. Some of these have to do with gratitude and thanksgiving and developing deeper levels of gratefulness. And I've been trying to explore some of these in my work, such as journaling, which, you know, is a spiritual discipline practice, exercise, whatever you want to call it, ways of doing spirituality, which strengthens the capacity to, you know, experience these states and all the benefits thereof. Uh, letters, you can write a letter to someone that you're grateful to and share that. I mentioned this yesterday and just expressing that gratitude. Gratitude and thanksgiving are outward expressions of an inward attitude. So we need the, both the private as well as the public aspects of gratitude, I think, in order to, for it to be most uh, fully recognized and fully um, realized in a person's life. Okay, uh, let's skip this. Sorry, I'm gonna, I, I do wanna mention something very, very important. And that has to do with, no, I'll skip that too. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to, here we go. I'm gonna read to you, a bunch of names, okay? This is now another audience participation uh, point. So you can put this in the chat if you can uh, think of what I'm trying to get at here. So I wanna read to you a list of names and I want you to tell me what they all have in common, okay? Some of these names should be familiar, others less so. Carl Bart, Cutter Calloway, Diana Bass Butler, Stanley Hauerwas, Peter Lightheart, Anne Voskamp, Robert Roberts, Elizabeth Hall, Paul Ricoeur, Julian of Norwich, Albert Schweitzer, Martin Heidegger, and Nicholas Walterstorff. That's a dozen names. Actually, it's a baker's dozen. Uh, it's 13 names. Theologians, yeah, some of them are. 
but not just who they are, but what they what they believed or what they said. Wrote about thankfulness. Who are grateful guys? I, I suppose they are. They all wrote a gratitude. That's true. Uh, this is kind of fun. Philosophers. I mean, we're all we're all theologians in the sense that we all have thoughts about God, right? Uh, philosophers. Yeah. So you can keep going, and I'll I'll keep going too. So what they all have in common, I believe, is the notion that identity, identity is the receptacle of gratitude. I'll say that again, identity is the receptacle of gratitude. Gratitude is not so much what we do, uh, what we feel, how we behave, or even what we think. Rather, it, it's who we are, okay? Gratitude is who we are, okay? Uh, Walter Storff, let me do just a couple of examples, right? Walter Storff said, to be human is to be that point in the cosmos where God's goodness is meant to find its answer in gratitude, okay? How about Karl Barth? Gratitude is the very being and essence of this creature. He's talking about man, humans, being creatures, right, of the creator. Gratitude is the very being and essence of this creature. He says, human being is gratitude. Okay. The life of gratitude must be understood radically. It's not a quality. It's not an activity. It's not just a change. And he says a change of temper or sentiment or conduct or action. Gratitude is the very being and essence of this creature. Human being is gratitude rather than being merely grateful. Elizabeth Hall, uh, my colleague at Biola, some of you know Liz, she writes, to be human is to be that place in creation where God's goodness find it, finds its answer in gratitude. When we see life as full of gifts and we are a receiver, our entire life is one big gift, enables us to organize our experience. So I, I believe this is true. I, I believe that it's part and parcel of who we are, seeing ourselves as receivers uh, of gifts and a potential giver of gifts onto other people constitutes our identity, the growth of identity, okay? Uh, making us aware of our past, who's helped us, who's contributed to who we are today. Uh, as we get older, we increasingly value gratefulness. In fact, one of the items on our GQ questionnaire is that as I get older, I can more better appreciate the people and circumstances and relationships and events that have transpired that contribute to who I am today. People sustain us and, and uh, events define us and culture influences us and shapes us and all shapes our identity. One more, Peter Lightheart said that gratitude is the truth of our existence. Our lives are given to us and our default state is gratitude. Gratitude, the place where we find our truest and best selves. I mean, isn't that amazing? There, there's an, a consolidation. Now, obviously, I haven't developed this as a, you know, fully thought out, you know, theory of gratitude, uh, but it just strikes me that so many people and from so many different perspectives and backgrounds and worldviews have said more or less the same thing about the nature and um, aspects of gratitude. It's just connected with, with who we are as individuals. So I am, who am I? I'm gratitude. I'm a grateful person. It's not just something I feel or do or perform or think about. It really constitutes my identity. Uh, I recently received this book in the mail. Uh, one of your colleagues at Fuller, I don't know if Cutter is with us uh, today, but I love this book, uh, Theology for Psychology and Counseling. I think it was just published, right? And he says in the book, how, again, how gratitude shapes identity, how being a receiver of gifts, a recipient of grace shapes who we are. The spirit perpetually calls, invites, and even persuades us to locate the center of our personal identity, not within ourselves, but outside ourselves, to receive it as a gift from God, right? And so um, a lot of the stuff I left out, maybe you can, uh, I, I know some of you were watching the slides as they were going by in this very fast presentation. Uh, Want to ask me some of those things in the question and answer period in a half hour from now, feel free to do so. One of the points that I want to make, and I'll make it then, but I'll make it now briefly, is that I think for us to go in gratitude, we grow sometimes the wrong way. 
we think about gratitude as something we need to do and to get better at. It, it becomes a, um, uh, a self-directed project. You know, it's like, I want to become more grateful. I need to focus on my gratitude growth or lack thereof. So I get so self-absorbed with my own level of gratitude. It takes the focus and puts the focus in the wrong place. Instead of being focused on what other people are doing for me or what God has done for me, I start to think about, no, how I need to become more grateful. And I, you know, I start to think, well, am I more grateful than other people? Am I more grateful than I was yesterday? You know, I want to be a 10 on your questionnaire and I'm only a seven. How do I move to a 10? And this actually gets in the way. My focusing on my gratitude performance actually gets in the way of my ability to be grateful. And uh, I've done a few studies like that where I found that when people are actually absorbing themselves in a task to become more, like using gratitude app on their phone, it actually works against they're becoming grateful. But when they're asked to write a letter or make a visit to someone or to write about how this person has helped shape who they are, they actually become more grateful. It deepens the level of gratitude. So the practice matters, how we, how we uh, focus matters, whether you focus on ourselves or focus on others. Gratitude involves you know, focusing on the good others have done for us as opposed to being absorbed with our own particular spiritual growth. Maybe that's the case for most spiritual exercises. I don't know. I'm not the practical theologian here, but I think the science that I've done that I'm familiar with certainly does seem to bear that out. So let me end. It is right at 11 o'clock with a quote from the German theologian Gerhard Forde who said that Christianity is not the move from vice to virtue, but rather the move from virtue to grace, right? So growth in gratitude. Is it the movement from ingratitude to gratitude? I, I think he would say not. It's more the move from trying to be grateful to trying to be a, just being a receiver, focusing not on what you need to do. I need to keep a gratitude journal. I need to read this gratitude book, attend that gratitude seminar and all those things, which can be useful, of course. But what he's saying is that, no, it's, it's seeing oneself as a receiver, focusing on what has been done as opposed mm. to what you need to do. I think ultimately this is the way to deepen and sustain one's level of gratitude over time. So, so that's my story. I am so excited to have Pam King respond right now. So Pam is going to grace us and bless us with some comments about the nature of gratitude from her perspective. So Pam, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Thank you, Bob. Great to be here. And what an honor to be able to respond to you, to someone who I have so admired and looked up to as a social scientist, um, and then only found out about your personal faith somewhere along in my journey. And it's been extraordinary uh, to see your example um, and to see the science. And I also wanted to start with an amen. Um, for one who said they were not a preacher, I felt like I heard some great preaching about grace and the amazing gifts um, that we receive from God. Um, well, I'll start by saying, Bob, that was a tour de force of gratitude, um, covering so much um, from interpersonal to divine to cosmic gratitude. And I also want to say I was a little nervous when I saw the subtitle about the king of vices. So I just want to say, <laughs> as I am king, <laughs> that I'm grateful. <laughs> and I do not want to be categorized as the king of vices. So let's just start there. Um, but thank you for the, the latitude and the amplitude um, of gratitude that you covered um, in this last hour. I um, like you, do not want to focus solely on the functional aspect of gratitude, but as the executive director of the Thrive Center, um, and one who is somewhat obsessed about enabling people to thrive, um, I am going to focus more on how um, gratitude to God may function as a virtue and promote thriving. So similar to what you just said, I've titled my talk, um, Gratitude, More Than a Feeling, and I am a child of the 80s, and I come from the city of that band's namesake, um, but want to think about gratitude to God as a virtue and a vehicle for thriving. Um, so today, um, at risk of oversimplifying uh, the complex research and oversimplifying um, virtues, I want to offer a little bit more of a framework 
um, for thinking about gratitude to God as a virtue and how that might relate to thriving. So specifically, I want to pick up on one of the last lines that Bob offered actually in his written address, and I don't think he said it, but I want to say it for you because it was wonderful. But he talked about gratitude involving ways of living that are both pathways for aspiring to the good life and also passages for attaining it. And today I want to suggest that the virtue of gratitude, especially cosmic gratitude, serves as a vehicle for thriving that allows us to detect those pathways towards our aspiration of the good life, as well as propel us along the passages um, in order to attain our understanding of the good life particularly as Christians. So as we move through the talk, I will be focusing on how gratitude can serve as both a guidance system um, and a fuel system uh, that allows us to thrive. Uh, but to be able to speak about thriving, I want to offer um, a definition of thriving. So if you look up thriving in the dictionary, um, thriving talks, uh, the dictionary will say that thriving involves good growth or involves vigorous growth. I'm sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulties with my slides here. Um, there we go. So thriving is vigorous growth. But as we all know, uh, not all go growth is good growth. We can grow in ingratitude, becoming more ingracious, and we don't want that. So in order to understand um, how um, we thrive and grow, we need to know the direction towards which we thrive. Um, and so as Christians, uh, we understand that we will be made whole, we will come to completion on the other side of eternity. Um, and that this life is a journey towards that. Um, and I'd just like to comment to make that point that thriving involves a very important direction, more so than a destination that it's the case that we are never gonna hear Siri. Now think your, your phone, I've got mine here. Um, giving directions, saying, you know, go 1.2 miles down Mindfulness Boulevard, uh, then turn right on Cognitive Control Way, and then merge on to Contextualized uh, Cultural Context Avenue, and you will arrive at your thriving destination on your left. We will not hear uh, Siri, this side of eternity, say that we've reached our destination because thriving is the journey, it's the process. Uh, but it is a journey in the specific direction. And that direction is set by the purposes for which God has created us. So in here, um, in the seminary, uh, I will drop one of my favorite words, the T word, talos. We conceive of the direction or the purposes for which humans um, are created as talos. And <clears throat> we understand that as, um, sorry, I am having a little bit of slide issues here. Um, we think of telos as the goal or completion um, or purpose for what we've been created. And as Christians, we understand that we are made to become more like Jesus. So we hope this life enables us to become more like Christ. We know that we are um, to become more of our unique self um, and that we are ever called to deepening and reciprocating relationships with one another. So in the Thrive Center, we translate that in a sense to think about a Thrive model, which involves individual development, uh, aspirational development, and relational development. So this is the journey towards which we uh, aspire to be developing. So I wanna think about how virtues as um, serve as a vehicle to move us along the way. Um, Dr. Emmons noted that virtues are complex um, and that they are comprised of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And as such, virtues um, allow us to be responsive. They're these rather plastic um, or adaptive constellation of psychological capacities that allow us to know, feel, and do what is right and good in different situations. So we habituate these patterns of thinking and feeling and doing that enable us to be adaptive and ninja-like in different situations to know how to respond with gratitude. So first I wanna talk a little bit more about the 
thoughts of gratitudes. Um, as Bob was just explaining, we have um, at least three explicit cognitive appraisals that are involved in gratitude. We become aware of, we think about the gift that we have received. Um, we think about the giver and we think about how we respond. Now, as Fry fellow Rebecca Bear so beautifully began to explain yesterday, our beliefs and the narrative that informs our life and how we make sense of the world provides meaning for these cognitive constructs. So for example, this might look like an old chain of beads, but it was a gift that I received from my 104 old great aunt when she passed away. So this gift might have more significance than it might appear. Um, our beliefs inform um, our understanding and our meaning of the giver or the benefactor. And the, our beliefs about that giver inform how we then respond and act. And I am very grateful to say um, that at the Thrive Center, I currently have one of the Gratitude to God grants that Bob um, was speaking of. So myself, along with Dr. Stephanie Trudeau and Susan Mangan, who are two Thrive postdocs, and Dr. Sung Kim, are one of our own School of Psychology and Marriage and Family, uh, th therapy professors here and three awesome Thrive Fellows um, are conducting a study and we've titled it Shades of Gratitude, Exploring Divine, Cosmic, and Personal Sources of Gratitude. And through this mixed method study, we are looking at how different belief systems um, and also different psychological bunk or tendencies uh, that include motivation systems, attachment systems, and our emotions, how that shapes how people experience gratitude differently. But in the quantity, qualitative arm of the study, we intentionally interviewed across three categories of belief systems that include participants from theistic belief systems like Christianity or Islam. Uh, we have a group of people who identified as spiritual, but not religious. And then we have a group of participants that identify as neither spiritual nor religious. And I wanted to give you a couple examples um, as we talk about gratitude, about how beliefs inform how people make these assessments about what the cosmic benefactor might be. So a woman um, says, who is spiritual but not religious, says when asked about um, gratitude, she says, well, there are a lot of commonalities I've seen in a lot of religions, but I can't conceptually nail it down to a specific, specific religion's God. We'll call it a higher power. And I'm really analytical, but I find I have to believe. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Overall, I am grateful to my higher, higher power or God um, because God has led me back, regardless of whether I've been in a place of making contact with God or recognizing God. God has recognized me and been there. So here she is as one who um, may not have a specific religious belief system, but has compiled um, an understanding of higher power or God that is always with her. Um, others in our study will attribute science. Uh, they will attribute, one even attributed black magic as a source of existential gifts like life. Um, in addition to the cognitive construals, in gratitude, we have feelings of gratitude. And these range, um, as Bob began to say, and I oversimplify into two categories. Um, one is positive emotions that are more elevated. They are expansive feelings like joy, delight, awe, and elevation. Um, in addition, there is another set of positive emotions that are more calming feelings. They are more peaceful. They may emerge, they may be kindled by our appreciation of daily gifts or routine occurrences. Um, for example, one of our Christians who's theistic uh, in the gratitude study said, a lot of time it has come back to God. Like there's thankfulness for what we have on an everyday level. I'm thankful for modern science. I'm thankful for hospital care where I can be reasonably sure that everyone's gonna be okay afterward. This experience of gratitude for things that are there, 
um, gives this person a sense of peace. And sometimes this is referred to as trait gratitude. But both of these sets of emotion, emotions, both the more elevating ones and the more calming ones, are very important uh, to how gratitude works to promote thriving. So in addition, um, we have the behaviors of gratitude. And I will lump these into two categories. One set of behaviors, as Bob explained, is responses to either our cognitive recognition um, of, of, of knowing and naming gratitude, and or perhaps to experiences or senses of the feelings of gratitude. And these are generally either enacted to thank the giver, or they are enacted to act in a way that aligns with our beliefs about the giver. This is an interesting quote from an atheist in our study who said um, when he resisted uh, naming a cosmic or divine source, not surprisingly, um, because of his beliefs, but he, when asked about gratitude, kept attributing people to being givers. Um, he said, when I feel grateful, I try to give back or reciprocate, whether it's just sending a thank you card or baking cookies or just doing something for them similar to what they've done for me. So he is taking his understanding of the giver and reciprocating, he's acting on those experiences of gratitude and reciprocating with similar actions. The second set of behaviors um, are, are what Bob was just talking about in terms of intentional um, practices that can help us cultivate. They can increase our awareness um, of the thoughts, feelings, and actions of gratitude. And what's very exciting is Bob and others' research has shown that they can make these responses um, more automatic. And what happens is the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors function together um, in a coordinated manner in gratitude, which is very exciting. So we can have experiences of top-down gratitude where our thoughts, um, of appreciation um, might trigger feelings or might inform actions, or we can have more bottom up experiences where perhaps we're caught in the midst of giving a response at a symposium and realize I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, but gratitude is important for thriving because these three dimensions um, activate us and they alert us to what is matter, what matters. They point us back to this telos or purpose. Um, in particular, cosmic gratitude provides opportunities for us to recognize, name, and rehearse uh, what is of value or where our value comes from and what matters most. Um, so I want to first say that gratitude, especially gratitude to God, can function like a navigational system. The thoughts, the feelings, and the behaviors of gratitude serve to enlist our senses, our emotions, our thoughts to orient us towards what matters most. They serve to align us to that purpose. So they can, in a sense, the emotions might say, alert, alert, this feels good. You feel gratitude. This is something that is important to you. So practices such as gratitude journaling, as Bob talked about, or even something like the examine prayer, provide opportunities for us to become attuned to feelings and to become aware of our beliefs and values that inform us and orient us and guide us um, towards our purpose and tell us. So in addition to serving as a guidance system or a GPS, a gratitude positioning system, um, gratitude also functions as a fuel system. And I think this is so exciting. Research has demonstrated that positive emotions are great for our brain. At times, um, they can rev us up um, and excite us, which motivates us towards um, pro-social ends, towards creativity, and they're like a gas pedal. And at other times, um, they can slow us down and calm us and make us more reflective and allow us to attune deeper to the feelings and be more aware of our aspirations. So furthermore, when we practice gratitude, the more automatic these thoughts, feelings, and behaviors can become. And they almost will operate like a more automatic navigational and fuel system. 
Um, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that cosmic uh, gratitude allows us to check out like we're in a self-driving car because you know even Teslas need to be calibrated and realigned. And that's where our aspirations, our sacred texts, and um, our beliefs are extremely important to keep us in mind. Well, I want to close by saying, um, if you are interested in learning more um, about gratitude and thriving or experiencing how practices of gratitude um, and other psychologically informed spiritual practices might contribute to thriving, I'm very excited to say that this week, um, Fuller launched the first Thrive Center class on our equipped platform, which you can find here, and there's some information in the text. In addition, the Thrive Center offices pra offers practices of gratitude and other psychologically informed spiritual practices that are based on research like that of which Bob has done for the last 20 years. So I'll close by saying um, we can be grateful for gratitude. It's complex. Those three appraisals that we need to make and the range of emotions are important because they give us opportunities for clarifying our coordinates and orienting us and connecting us ultimately as Bob said, to the giver. Perhaps the highest form of gratitude is the experience of the giver of God as the gift itself. And as you continue your journey of thriving, attend to gratitude. And may the thoughts, the feelings, and behaviors associated with gratitude not only draw attention to the many gifts in your life, but enable you to recognize that you are in the hands of the giver oneself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emmons and Dr. King for your respective lecture and response, as well as both of your research on gratitude and human flourishing and thriving. It is a privilege to be able to participate in this year's symposium. Today, I'd like to respond to how today's lecture on how I have observed gratitude as a virtue, practice, and even spirit in my own Korean cultural context, as I've collected data over the years from my lived experiences, as well as drawn themes from my clinical work. From Dr. Emma's lecture, we know that gratitude is an important component in shaping the human experience. I feel this is being communicated to us when so many are probably feeling wary from experiencing loss and tragedy, and maybe struggling with the concept of gratitude, especially given the last two years. Gratitude helps us acknowledge the goodness or good things in one's life, as well as acknowledge that this benevolence can be found both in and outside of the self. Dr. Emmons further highlighted that Christian gratitude is unique because the acceptance of all good and bad fortune is a form of humility in the face of God's unchanging nature. I find truth in this statement because of the otherworldly quality we see when those who have little to be thankful for according to the world persist in singing praises of gratitude. I believe these are individuals who embody a grateful spirit and have it embedded in the very essence of who they are. Brother Steindl Rast differentiates between a transpersonal gratefulness over personal thankfulness, the latter which occurs more directly between people, but the former one, transpersonal gratefulness, extends beyond the gift, giver, and receiver, and manifests as a deeper overall celebration that something bigger has happened outside of the act of benevolence. This transpersonal gratefulness might even occur in the presence of suffering, which I believe deepens and matures the practice of gratitude. So first, I'd like to use this idea that Christian gratitude is unique as a pivoting point to offer an additional perspective on the relationship between gratitude, suffering, and even lament, and do so from my own particular vantage point. As the eldest daughter of a Korean Presbyterian immigrant pastor, I grew up witnessing a lot of pain in our parishioners. From a young age, I saw some of the elderly in our churches silently and wistfully longing to be back in their homeland, but staying because their children and grandchildren's home was here in the US. I saw many who held prestigious professions in Korea, but due to language and other cultural barriers, 
took manual labor jobs that held little meaning for them and watched the twinkle of pride gradually dim from their eyes. I saw incredibly intelligent and dignified people looked down upon and regarded as less than simply because of their broken English. I heard whispers of marriages crumbling under the stress of adjusting to a new culture. And at times I felt a sad but growing rift between older and younger generations as one fought to keep tradition alive while the other quickly embraced a new culture. And yet many embodied a grateful spirit despite their pain. One memorable experience I have occurred one morning when my sister and I accompanied my parents to early morning prayer service, which we call Hebyokido, and, and we always followed them during school holidays. At the end of these services, my father would dim the sanctuary lights, which signified the start of a sustained prayer time. And there were always a few parishioners who would stay behind and pray, but they weren't silent praying with a few tears and sniffles. They were wailing, the kind of crying that you know came from the depths of their soul. As a child, it felt quite frightening to hear, almost like I wasn't supposed to hear these sounds, but yet this would always last from a few minutes to a few hours. So that morning on the car ride home, I asked my parents what the adults were wailing about. And the surprising answer that I still remember to this day was this. They said, they're crying out their pain and gratitude to God. That felt really confusing to my young mind because I wondered how is that even possible? Because when I'm sad, I cry. When I'm happy, I laugh. And when I feel grateful, I say, thank you. I experienced three separate emotions and three separate responses. So how can words expressing pain and thanks come out at the same time? And yet something about that answer felt deeply, deeply satisfying. They had this unworldly grateful disposition that did not diminish despite their pain. They coexisted and were experienced simultaneously without canceling each other out. In my training, I have often wondered how to sit with my Korean and Asian clients as they express their pain, but also their gratitude at the same time. My supervisor, Dr. Pak, frequently says to me that we have to walk the tightrope and do both and, not either or. And while this is usually referencing for people who identify as dual culture or dual identities, I believe this also applies here because humans are such complex beings that can experience a wide range of emotions at any one time. If they're in pain, we mourn with them and help them emotionally process that pain. When they rejoice out of gratefulness to God and other people, we rejoice with them and help them process that as well. We help them process both pain and acknowledge the goodness they received. Second, Dr. Emmons cited research that carefully explains the difference between gratitude to God and gratitude to people and how both can help us understand ourselves. As believers, gratitude directed towards God reminds us that God in his benevolence gives us good gifts that we often do not deserve. In some ways, it shows us that we are indebted to him for he gives us things that we cannot fully repay. So when we thank God, we demonstrate our dependence upon him to sustain us. And when we feel sustained by his benevolence, we can maybe then find ourselves with increased capacity to give to others through reciprocity. Additionally, in my clinical training, I have seen another way that gratitude toward other people, especially to one's family, can tell us something about how that person understands their identity. For the last two years, as I have been learning how to conduct culturally sensitive Korean therapy, and as my supervisor and I have reflected on my clinical work thus far, I kept noticing many of my clients were living with a sense of duty and responsibility to their families and felt indebted to the elders. At times I felt they were interchanging duty and responsibility and indebtedness with gratitude, but there was no negative connotation. The majority of my clients have been living in the young, have been in the young professional age group and almost all identify as 1.5 to second generation Korean American, which means that they are fairly acculturated to the American culture. Many sought therapy to work on issues such as anxiety, depression, 
relationship concerns, and difficulties adjusting to the COVID-19 pandemic. But when I really attuned to their narratives, many were living with the sense of duty to their parents to succeed and make something of themselves as a way to show gratitude for their parents and elder sacrifice of leaving their homeland for better opportunities for their children and future generations. Influenced by ancient Confucian virtues that valued filial piety or the practice of honoring one's parents and elders, these values were deeply and unconsciously embedded in some of my clients as well, in spite of their acculturation levels. In other words, my clients felt indebted to their parents for their sacrifice, and they were also grateful. Their indebtedness and gratitude were more interrelated than separate. Dr. Emmons titled his lecture today, You Are What You Think, and I'd like to borrow that phrase to summarize what my Korean clients taught me and are still teaching me today. In their spirit of gratitude towards their parents and elders, my clients demonstrate their view of the self as being more interconnected to others. In other words, in their indebtedness and thankful gratitude to their families and elders, they acknowledge that their individual self is part of one whole collective unit. In their gratitude towards their families, they show us who they are, where they come from, and ultimately demonstrate another way to understand their identity. So with that said, I'd like to end by aligning with Dr. Emmons' statement about the spiritual or cosmic gratitude containing both a vertical and horizontal dimension, orienting a person toward God and towards others. I have also wondered throughout the various stages of my life if gratitude as a practice and virtue and even spirit is yet another way that we can stay interconnected to both God and to others. In a world and during a time that makes us feel paradoxically close and distant to one another simultaneously, in the midst of prolonged suffering and grief, and even amongst all of these different cultural contexts, I like to think our ability to practice gratitude is a gift itself from the spirit of God to allow us to stay connected to one another and ultimately remember where we come from. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Emmons, Dr. King, and thank you, Hannah, so much for, uh, for these, these amazing presentations and responses today. Uh, before we get into our question and answer, I just want to remind you again to, that you can put questions in the Q&A button at the bottom right of your Zoom window, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. Again, remember, it also allows you to vote for questions that you'd like to see answered, and that will move them up to the top of the queue. So, um, please, please um, do that as well. Uh, just like last, uh, or just like yesterday, Dr. Emmons, I just wanted to give you a minute uh, or two to respond to anything that um, has been uh, uh, caused you to think from Dr. King or Hannah. Well, uh, tough to do that in a minute or two. I mean, the, the power and the provocativeness and the persuasiveness of those presentations was just, I mean, overwhelming. Uh, I hope you guys, by the way, Hannah and Pam, you can see the chat because you're getting a lot of love in the chat for your contributions. So uh, I'm not alone. Me and Brad and everyone else uh, really appreciate uh, the depth of your comments. Um, uh, Hannah, I was especially uh, grateful that you mentioned Brother David Steindl Rast. Uh, he's like my hero, my gratitude guru and mentor and hero. Uh, I've learned more about gratitude from uh, Brother David than anyone else, you know, uh, I've had the fortune of meeting him uh, and uh, hanging out with him a few times. He's like, I think he just turned 96 in uh, July of uh, 95. He'll be 96 this year in July. And if I was going to uh, recommend like one book for anyone to read about gratitude, especially in the context of spiritual practices and prayer, it would be Brother David's book which I just happen to have right here. <laughs> uh, gratefulness, the heart of prayer. Uh, that's, I recommend this book more than any other one if you want to learn about you know, the spiritual foundations of gratefulness. And he's done more to uh, facilitate interreligious dialogue than anyone else as well. But anyway, but yeah, I mean, the whole notion that gratitude 
just uh, wells up within us and it cries for expression as you so poignantly demonstrated. Uh, and, you know, there's really no way to capture that in empirical science. You know, it just comes up so short. And I, I just feel so humbled when I, when I, you know, hear people like you talking about the personal meaning and power of gratitude and just what a disconnect there is and how frustrated I am that the science can't really get at that. You know, yeah, we can, you know, develop this measure and ask people about that and, you know, look at this effect in their lives. But just what, what you hear in the, you know, in the therapy room, uh, just, you know, what, uh, you know, what pastors hear, you know, in their congregations and counseling, it just goes so far beyond, you know, what we can do as empirical scientists. And that, that's, I mean, that's integration for me. You know, that's when I think about gratitude at so many different levels and layers and involving perspectives that come from the, you know, using the tools and techniques of modern science to, to shed light on something that's just so deeply and personally powerful as gratefulness. So I appreciate the comments of both of you. And, and Pam, I just wanted to ask you, well, first, I didn't know you're from Boston. Uh, that's cool. I thought it was Chicago. Oh, <laughs> more than a feeling. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure they. I'm gonna Google that. Probably, right that's really bad. You probably, you probably heard them in concert in Chicago. That's what it was. <laughs> it's okay. I, I heard them in concert in Maine. But uh, anyway, uh, now that I've embarrassed you, but listen. So, so here's a question for you. So, what do you think about? Uh, you've done a lot of work with, of course, adolescents, young adults, and so forth. Uh, and, you know, your work on spiritual exemplars. Uh, mm -hmm. I've always thought of exemplary. You know, research pun intended um do you find that they they talk um about gratitude does, does it come up as a theme uh or not i mean to me this this goes beyond that it really is about you know one of the questions i get most often uh from like parents is how can i get so and so to become more grateful mm -hmm. sometimes it's a spouse usually it's a child most often a teenager or adolescent, you know, and, you know, you have adolescents, I had them now they're 21 and 25. So they're beyond that stage. But, you know, it, it, do you think gratitude is something that comes easily or naturally to people of this age group or going through these, you know, life stages, or is it something which really is, is more of a challenge? And if so, uh, we need to approach it maybe differently than we would our own, you know, uh, spiritual growth in gratitude. Mm -hmm. Bob, I wish I could like pull quotes out of the top of my head, but I haven't <laughs> put in those transcripts real, real recently. But one thing um, I will suspect is that um, you know, with exemplar adolescents, it's a really unique group. Um, so we're looking at more of an idealized teleological version of what we're looking for. But yeah. I'm gonna suspect it was because these young people were so able to clearly articulate like a giver. They were very clear on mm. a source of where, of where life was coming from. And it was an extremely diverse group of adolescents, um, new different belief systems, whether they were Sikh or atheist, um, Christian, Jewish. Um, and they had such a profound awareness and appreciation for life around them. These were kids who could really see meaning in typical things. Um, they were very clear also that their faith gave them purpose um, in how they lived their life. So I, I'm gonna go back and look, but I'm, I'm guessing that they would, but they weren't typical kids. But from a developmental perspective, um, and I'm so curious about our Shades of Gratitude project, that it seems that for those younger that have a more anthropomorphized understanding of whatever the cosmic giver is, that more concrete and more human-like uh, imagination seems to be easier for young people to, to access and, and be aware of. Um, I don't know that kids in general make the attribution of the gift um, as being connected to the giver as we might, but they seem to be able to identify that there is where. So I think helping, make helping kids make that connection between the gift and the giver even if it is uh, the, the, the beads from my aunt um, and, and God gave me my aunt to help kids connect those dots developmentally is really important in terms of meaning. Mary Helen Mordino Yang at USC 
does a lot of interesting research on how those more abstract beliefs become internalized for children and adolescents. Great, great, thank you. Thank you so much. I want to um, jump in here and get us into the questions. And I want to actually, I think, summarize a theme that's emerging in a, a number of the questions and Hannah that I think you so beautifully brought up. And that is, what is what do we know cross-culturally about gratitude? Um, and earlier, Bob, you talked about moving from thin understandings of gratitude to a thicker understanding of gratitude, which of course not only includes like um, gratitude situated within particular religious context, but, but situated with a particular cultural context. And for example, the difference between an individualistic culture and a collectivist culture. So I'm wondering if anyone, any three of the three of you can talk a little bit about that, what we know about gratitude related to cultural differences. Sure, uh, I'll just take a stab at it. Um, a few ideas off the top of my head. And I know there are you know, a good, handful of studies that have you know, explicitly tried to look at uh, d both differences, but also as a cultural phenomenon. So, I mean, just perspective of, you know, religious traditions we have. So we can think of gratitude as something which is embedded in traditions, but also transcends traditions. Uh, so there are elements of it that, you know, gratitude receives particular uh, form and context within a tradition. But there are elements which transcend those as well. So, you know, I, I, I believe this is the case, and I've argued this for as long as I've studied gratitude, that the, it really is a human universal, that mm -hmm. it's something that has something very specific about who we are and, and what we need in terms of relationships. And, and as I mentioned today, uh, in terms of constructing an identity as us as receivers, but also as givers. And I think that's pretty much, if it's not universal, it's certainly cross-culturally recurrent. Uh, I think, you know, one could make that case and, and defend that uh, perspective. Now, the particular ways in which that's played out in terms of the giving, receiving of gifts and norms and practices within it, each of those locations, right, uh, is going to be different, obviously. I mean, it has to be. You'd be shocked if it was all the same, right? So the meaning may be different. The expression is different. The degree to which, you know, gratitude co-occurs with, you know, obligation or indebtedness, as Hannah beautifully pointed out. The degree to which that indebtedness is seen as pleasant or as unpleasant do can we tolerate that debtedness do we like that do we like feeling you know indebted because that you know makes us closer to the giver uh to the benefactor or is that something we want to discharge as soon as possible uh that's a very different uh, valence to it i think you know that can differ in terms of person's culture and worldview uh and so on so yeah that's that's an easy way out right to say that there's universal as well as local uh <laughs> components to it but room for more research in that area, I'm hearing. <laughs> more research is needed, as they say. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Fred, can I throw in something there? Please. Uh, again, I'll point to Mary Helen and Mordino Yang's research, who's looked at expression of motion um, cross culturally and also gene size at Stanford. Um, that different cultural, we become, we, ex we might express motions differently, but we've got the similar stuff going on in our brain. Um, so we need to understand what are normative expressions and behaviors as Bob was speaking about. A hypothesis I have that I would like to be able to study as we unpack the varying degrees um, aspects of gratitude to God is that the reference or the giver, um, I would hypothesize that the more sacred or more special or more powerful the reference is, uh, the more potentially agentic. Um, so if God is deemed as powerful or good um, and loving, or whether it is science, if I have a different worldview, or if I might come from a culture that has more a, a different ontology about the connection of all of humanity and somehow that is working um, towards giving gifts, that these different views, beliefs, um, it might be the extent to which they are deemed sacred, important, or meaningful might impact how much the meaning of the gift means. Um, so there could be totally different worldviews, but it might have more to do with how important they are, how much, how much bearing they bring um, on a person's life. I think what I've sort of experienced in my personal life and as well as what I've seen in my clients is it's hard to tease out where kind of one starts and ends. Um, so like the gratitude and the indebtedness component, um, 
you know, like literally on Tuesday, a client was weeping both out of pain from her family of origin, but also it was just enriched with gratitude. And we were sort of looking at that and, you know, um, yeah, so it is hard to kind of tease out where those begin, at least for me. And I think it's been modeled, um, at least in my family. Um, Great, thank you. Thank it's hard you. to imagine uh, there's a sociologist that uh, is quoted from time to time in the, in the literature on gratitude, especially when it's interdisciplinary work, who said something like, you know, just, uh, just try to imagine uh, a society without gratitude or relationships without gratitude, mm -hmm. right? What would cause those relationships to you know, persist and endure over time? Mm -hmm. I mean, would it just be pure contracts, right? Would it just be, you know, uh, it, it wouldn't be the, 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 um, the, the emotional uh, aspect of it that oils the wheels of reciprocity, right? We, we would have a contract, we would have, again, as I mentioned before, it's like, if, if I was gonna give you a gift and I said, okay, this is what I wanna return, uh, Where's gratitude in that? Gratitude no longer plays a role in that. So, I mean, relationships and society would just, would just crumble. It, it would just fall apart. I mean, try to imagine yourself without something that you're grateful for or someone you're grateful to or an experience that you're grateful for, right? Just try to just imagine the absence of gratitude. What would life be like? I, I don't know. I, I can't do that mental work, <laughs> but, you know, try, try to imagine love. Somebody yesterday asked the question about love and gratitude, which is a great question. And I don't have an answer for that. I think, you know, that love is the greatest gift uh, and that we're grateful for receiving the gift of love. So, you know, gratitude works that way, but try to imagine, think of a loving relationship and then think about loving that person. Then think about being grateful for that person. It strikes me that's a different feeling. Okay. Because then you would, you would treat that person differently because you perceive that they, they don't have to be there. What would my life be like, you know, without my wife, for example, Right. or without someone else uh, that I dearly love. It would be a very different kind of relationship and I would treat that relationship differently, being grateful for it as a gift that I'm not entitled to or not deserving of. So, um, you know, again, I think this is a kind of basic response, even though gratitude is not a, a basic emotion, as Pam said, it's, it's more than a feeling. There's something very, very universal about it that says something very deeply about who we are as human beings. Great. Well, let me ask you to imagine, you imagine something, Bob, and the rest of you <laughs> in the questions here, or the questions actually worded, could you tell us something about how gratitude relates to humility? Yeah, uh, excellent. So I think there are a number of capacities that make it possible to become a grateful person. Okay. Not just to experience gratitude momentarily as a response to receiving a gift, but also, I mean, more, more broadly uh, and more enduringly as a basic disposition or, or virtue as uh, Pam has used the language. So, I mean, how can you be grateful uh, without being aware of your need, your dependency, right? To, I mean, humility is being able to accept a gift, right? And, and saying, I can't do this all by myself. Uh, I can't uh, bring about all the things I need to have brought about, right? I need help. I need assistance. I, I recognize myself as a dependent being upon others doing things for me that I can't do for myself. And so I think, you know, and Brother David talks about this in his book, actually, right here on my desk, about how, you know, humility is the basis for gratitude. It really starts there. So just to be open to the contributions of others and realizing that, you know, I didn't do it all by myself. And one of the reasons why I mentioned yesterday, I think gratitude is countercultural because so much pressure tells us, no, you've got to do it on your own. You've got to take credit for your success, right? Our, our, our identity is based on our performance. It's based on our accomplishments, you know, not who I am, but what I do. Who I am is based on what I do and my successes, right? And all the approval and attention and affection I get from other people. It's not based on the gifts that I've received. It's based on my own accomplishments. And so we're, you know, that sounds like a definite lack of humility in those cases. And so, yeah, I, I think there's, there's at least five qualities that are necessary for gratitude to persist and endure and for us to grow in gratitude. Humility is one of those, right? I, I think the capacity for redemption to go from the bad to the good. Can anything good come out of something bad, right? And we talked about this yesterday in terms of suffering, in terms of extracting, you know, benefit from a terrible experience. So that's necessary. 
uh, a sense of identity, which is what I tried to move toward today in my thinking about just us as grateful people, how that's necessary for us to live uh, gratefully. Um, so I don't want to go through all five of them, that'll take up all the time, but yeah, humility, I think is right at the core of what's needed to be a grateful person. Great. Hannah or Pam? I, I'll elaborate on the coordinates idea of this um, navigational system that the cognitive appraisals that we voluntarily or involuntarily make in gratitude I think help us locate ourselves in the in the cosmic world. And it, it, it triggers an opportunity to have that right perspective of who we are. Um, that is something that we often talk about with humility is having that right perspective. So it connects me to God, the giver, the creator of life. It puts my dependency, as Bob said, on the table. It's a gentle reminder or it's an invitation to be reminded of those. But it's also very important that um, Self-reflection in and of itself or in a vacuum is not enough for that coordinate system. That there is, you know, the gospel narrative. There are other, there are coordinates out there uh, that different people ascribe to. And that how important, as you've been talking about thin or thick understandings of gratitude, we need to hold like as Christians, scripture, um, theology, our, our beliefs, our sacred writings, um, in concert with that reflection so that we are we are directing with the right coordinates in mind. And humility is something that gets prompted um, easily in that process. Yes, yes. There's a, um, you know, I think of humility as having a proper perspective of oneself, mm -hmm. you know, uh, one's talents, one's abilities. So not just being the receiver of gifts, but also the giver of gifts, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we, we find ourselves, I think as Miroslav Volf, who, um, Rebecca mentioned yesterday, so his work on joy, uh, has talked about humans as being kind of finding ourselves midstream in the flow of gifts, right? We receive gifts, you know, from God, from others. We then give gifts back, right, to God and to others. And so they don't, they don't end with us, you know, they don't start with us, but we are we're kind of like in that middle, midstream of gifts. And that's part of the, part of the identity of oneself as a receiver, as well as a giver. And I think humility gives us a proper perspective on that. Hannah, did you want to chip in on something on humility? No, I was just going to align with all, <laughs> all of those. I think it just reminds us that we're not doing this on our own. It really counteracts yes. the individualistic mindset and that we are all relating with each other. Like we can't exist on our own. I think the, uh, you know, the pandemic, if it's done anything, it's reminded us of that. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, how many how many virtues have been, you know, uh, have been amplified? Uh, in the past couple of years, you know, one of those, I think, it is a sense of gratitude, right, for, for, uh, for medicine, for uh, pharmaceuticals, for healthcare providers, for you know, supply chain, you know, people and processes, you know, that make it possible for us to, you know, survive and to get on with life through everything we've gone through. And uh, I, I think I've seen a few studies showing that gratitude levels have increased uh, in the past couple of years. So it's, uh, uh, you know, kind of a naturalistic laboratory where we, you know, or we, we, we've had things taken away from us that we otherwise would have been very grateful for. We didn't realize how much we depended upon these things, uh, like seeing colleagues in person instead of over the screens, uh, for example. <laughs> what a great thing it was that uh, we could actually get together again. Hopefully you'll be able to get together again down there in Fuller pretty soon. Um, you know, there are things that happen that will raise our levels of gratitude that happen naturally and uh, and so we can all learn from those and experience those in a more grateful way. Yeah. Here's an interesting question. Um, how can we think about gratitude in relation to justice? If gratitude mm -hmm. is an appropriate response to a gift, can we say that we owe gratitude? Is failing to show gratitude a, an injustice? Well, I know there's various thoughts on that and streams of thought from people who have written about this and thought about it for a long time. Uh, I mean, I would come out on the side and say, yes, uh, I think so. Um, one of the things I mentioned yesterday was that even if we don't feel grateful, we need to express because it's the right thing to do. So there are justice-based or juridical reasons for expressing gratitude because, you know, it's owed to that person who's going out of their way to do something for us, uh, to help us. And we perceive benevolence. So we were want to respond in a proper um, degree based upon the, you know, the cost involved and their intention, all of those things that 
make it a, an occasion for gratitude. Um, and yeah, I think, I think the question is whether we see ourselves as a debtor or not, whether we see ourselves as gladly indebted or as something which is painful and we want to remove as, as quickly as possible. Um, then there's the issue of what if we don't actually get a gift, but the person has intended to benefit? Do we still owe the person gratitude then? You know, somebody, uh, they say, okay, I'll, I'll uh, offer to help you get a job. And then, you know, it, does, it falls through and we don't get the, so we don't actually get the benefit, but we still owe that person thanks, right? Because they tried the extended effort on our behalf. What if we don't like the gift, right? How many have gotten, you know, Christmas presents, birthday presents that were horrible, right? That, you know, wasn't the right thing. And that, um, but yeah, we still owe the giver thanks because it was their intention, which we are grateful for. We're grateful for their graciousness as opposed to the thing itself. So yeah, I think it's owed in those cases. I think it makes sense to talk about it as, um, as a debt that we want to discharge in a proper way. Uh, at the right time and proper degree, which is what makes gratitude a virtue. Fred, I'd also offer, um, and this is where the teleological perspective for me is really helpful, that human thriving has to be tied to a flourishing world. Um, mm -hmm. So even if we think theologically about consummation and all of creation being brought to completion, um, and in this era when we're much more highly attuned to the fragility of our planet, that if our thriving, what feels like thriving to us is a cost for marginalized persons or our planet um, or results in injustice for others, that's not actual thriving. So that gratitude in its ultimate sense needs to attune us to what is just. And that will adapt over time. Like we didn't realize in the 70s that we needed to attune to issues around our planet. We have a slight heightened sensitivity um, to race and racism in this era. Um, the pandemic has heightened um, our connection to one another and heightened this obligation. And so gratitude, I think in its thickest conceptualization needs to have this like eschatological perspective and global perspective of how does my version of what matters of what I'm most grateful for, how does that align and propel me in a way that is contributing um, to the greater good and to God's um, work in this world. Great, great. I want to ask another question um, personally here because I'm thinking about that there must be some pastors and practical theologians on this call um, and they've been hearing you talk about developing gratitude um, and if we go back to what Dr. Yang said yesterday about the place of worship and communal practices, maybe with even within, if we think specifically within faith traditions, and we can also again bring back the collectivist question here around collectivist cultures. I'm wondering, and Pam, again, your work around the, and what Rebecca said, meaning making narratives of gratitude. I'm wondering if you, you three could just um, vamp for a second on what's the role of a religious community in creating narratives of gratitude? What would you say to a pastor or someone in a ministry context who's trying to figure out how to make this useful to their community? Or what have you seen that's been useful? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it first. Uh, I think uh, the big distinction that I have seen, and I think it's really important, uh, probably not an original observation, but when gratitude, and I was trying to allude to this toward the end of my presentation, when gratitude is kind of divorced from a larger context, mm -hmm. uh, it ceases to be, I think, an effective spiritual way of being in the world. Mm -hmm. So when gratitude becomes an end in itself, or an end to other ends. So here's a strategy or tactic for becoming happier, healthier, your relationships will improve, you know, uh, people will like you better, or, you know, you, you will tithe more. So we want to increase gratitude because people become more generous in the congregation or grateful patients will give more to the hospitals and so on. Now, it doesn't work, right? Because we know, and the pastors who know this, and uh, the ones I've talked to know this, and, and we'll talk quite a lot about this, how about how, you know, you can, you can get people to change their behavior based on guilt, uh, but they won't, they won't be motivated for very long, right? So you can, you know, so guilt is not a great motivator for change, but grace is, okay? 
So it seems to me from my own experience in the churches that I've attended, uh, the ones where I felt the most gratitude uh, to God as, to, as well as to others, don't even talk about gratitude that much, right? The focus is on God's goodness, God's greatness, mm -hmm. God's graciousness. If I focus on the greatness of God, what God has done for me, what God has done for all of us, then gratitude naturally flows from that. It doesn't have to be a focus in and of itself. Right. And so um, well, I focus on, you know, the bigger context, maybe this is what Jonathan Edwards meant by the, the supernatural versus natural gratitude, just who God is and what God has done. Uh, gratitude is the natural response to that. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, techniques are not useful, that, you know, small groups that focus on gratitude journaling or gratitude accountability. That, I think that's all useful. It's all good. It all has its place. But I don't think that's the starting or ending point. I think it starts and ends with God's love and God's goodness. Great, great. I don't know. Would you like to say something? I, I was just going to mention that in the Korean church, what I've seen is this. So there's this thing of Han where there's this collective unconscious, this collective pain. And um, sometimes when, you know, when we wail out of that kind of pain, there isn't fully words that can capture what it is that we're in pain about. Mm -hmm. And so this type of like early morning prayer that I was mentioning, um, I think, again, there was a sense of kind of wailing together in that communal space. And that that sort of fed this sense of, at least that's what I've seen and felt, is that they've fed this sense of gratitude that, oh, I don't, this wailing as embarrassing as it feels, I'm not doing it alone and other people can understand without me fully like identifying what words, you know. Um, and so I think it's just kind of unspoken, that feeling um, that and that's why I like that with spirit when I'm talking about this is because it's just felt. Great, thank you. Hannah. And I, I, I love that. I was gonna say that you need inclusive narratives around gratitude. So that we're not just grateful for what is for me, but grateful for what propels the we of broader society. Um, and I love that this word that doesn't have a specific meaning is something that people can communally participate in um, that is inclusive and that we can all voice this lament um, in unison and, and it can be spoken for others as well. And I think if I were working with the church, working with the church, I would want to encourage a church to be able to voice gratitude or voice lament for those things that are lost or grief communally, which is not something Protestants do as well. And also to reinforce prayers of what not I am grateful, but what we are grateful for and how those things move us towards a more just and whole society. Wonderful. Well, we're at the end here. So let me thank you again, uh, Bob and Pam and Hannah. Thank you so much um, for another amazing morning of thinking about gratitude. Uh, and I want to remind everyone who's watching, if you're receiving CEs, as I mentioned before, please note your attendance on Zoom is recorded. A completed evaluation be, will be required at the end of the week. A post-event survey will be sent to everyone is registered. The evaluation form will be available to download, download on the last page of that survey along with instructions on how to submit it. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We are grateful that you are here with us. We're grateful for, for uh, Bob and for our panelists. And we hope that you will join us again uh, tomorrow for our third and final lecture series at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Please again, refer to your Eventbrite email or Eventbrite online event page for ac accessing the unique link for tomorrow's lectures. That's a lot of words. So I'm gonna wish you well, and we hope to see you all tomorrow. Hey, tomorrow's a big day. I'm gonna talk about climate change and gratitude. Something I know nothing about, climate change. So I'm gonna need help from you all. So if you care about the environment, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks Bob for telling, yeah, thanks for that. See ya. All right, bye. Thank you.